Right. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, this presentation is kind of uh, my brain scatter dumped onto a presentation slash a demo. It, uh, it makes sense to me, but sometimes it doesn't make sense to other people. So just let me know if it, it doesn't make sense or you have questions, etc. Um, just go off mute, ask, ask away, um, happy to help. I've also got some um, like live polls to uh, question you, question everyone on as well. I don't, I don't know how to get the polling feature in um, in Teams working, so I've just got a link in chat that I'll push out and it's just a quick poll uh, to, to go through. I'll basically be talking about uh, net infrastructure as code or breaking down network as code as, as people call it now or net DevOps and how you can go from not knowing nothing to uh, deploying a pretty workable solution in a limited amount of time and doing everything from testing and to to deploying code or generating configuration templates uh, uh, for different purposes and we'll we'll go through that so a bit about me oh um, i'm not clicked on the right thing hopefully everyone can see that can you see that uh june awesome thanks darren i can see darren yep. nodding yeah <laughs> um um professional services consultant i've been at axian four years and I mainly work on network automation. So anything from the ad hoc scripts that we do to building our fully managed service to full automation solutions that we've, we've delivered for a number of our customers using similar techniques as I'll show you today. Uh, today's stuff is not very in depth and not very, um, not very, yeah, I was gonna say clever, but it is clever, um, you know, it, every customer is different and the network automation projects vary uh, among them. Another main facet of mine is SD-WAN, so anything to do with WANs across multiple regions uh, connected to each other, uh, I primarily focus on two vendors, that is uh, Silver Peak SD-WAN, which has been acquired by G uh, Aruba recently, and uh, Versa SD-WAN, Versa Networks. Uh, both different ends of the scale in terms of uh, SD WAN technologies. Um, another part of my um, job here at Axions is to do uh, software development slash integrations into different products. So things like uh, our monitoring tool into ServiceNow, uh, making sure that our ITSM database is synced across uh, multiple different platforms, etc., and make sure ticketing is okay. Um, we do have a dedicated person for ServiceNow, but I make sure that the software talks to ServiceNow and the, it does the right processing on the back end um, with the uh, the right tables, etc. within ServiceNow. And the last one is cloud and NFE technologies. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that uh, in a bit, but basically uh, virtualizing network functions at the edge. So having a virtual firewall, um, a virtual router, a virtual SD-WAN appliance, and even going into applications now of, of deploying that on the white box hardware at the edge. So I, I mainly focus on that for some of our service provider customers. So where did my automation journey, and I was speaking to Mark earlier, uh, as we worked together at Cisco. Um, I was an intern at Cisco when uh, Mark on the call was, a, was a, an engineer there. And within Cisco, I was lucky enough to, to study university and get a, an internship at Cisco. Um, there was four of us in total and we managed the lab that was in uh, Reading. The lab was many racks, a, a lot of racks. And um, during that time, we got to put our hands on a lot of Cisco gear that network, you know, people starting out in their network career never get to touch. So as ACI was coming up back in the day, um, we were racking and stacking and loading images onto it for the, the test engineers, etc. And we also got the opportunity to work with the test engineers to uh, work on their test plans. So execute test cases, work with the Ixia, etc. Which allowed me to uh, do my uh, certifications. So I did my CCMP while at Cisco, but also during my time at Cisco, I kind of got hold of PHP and started working on an internal tool that Mark will know well. And that was uh, an internal tool. Anyone heard of Netbox? 
it was Netbox before Netbox existed. Um, it managed all of the projects, the ticketing, everything. Um, it was an internal tool developed by uh, some of the guys at Cisco. And I become a developer for that. And after I finished my internship, uh, they kept me on for another six months during my third year of university to uh, be a PHP developer remote while I was doing my third year of university. So it's PHP and Laravel framework, etc. Also got to learn a bit about uh, Python. I worked with uh, an engineer at Cisco called Lewis, Lewis Cartwright, um, who is a, a very good engineer and he primarily worked with BT, but he was interested in network function for function virtualization, which is where I I um, got in my grasp into virtualizing network functions. And we used uh, a Cisco product, Cisco NSO with a Elastic Service Orchestrator, I think ESI or whatever, Elastic Service Infrastructure or something like that. I can't remember the acronym, but um, we worked on that, that product to deploy virtual iOS devices to the edge on a on a UCS like device uh, or a ASR with a compute module, for example. And that's where I got my hands into NSO. When I went back to university, I did my third year dissertation on comparing open source versus closed source. So because I worked at uh, Cisco at the time, I got a hand of uh, got my hands on Cisco NSO and compared it against Ansible. And I wrote a 175 page document about the pros and cons of each and how to configure them, etc. And um, got some really cool stuff out of it. But a good part of my dissertation was that I built a full OSS BSS platform around Cisco NSO. Um, for my for my dissertation um, using PHP that I learned while I was at Cisco, um, that you could de deploy layer free VPNs. You just put site A to site B, and it'll pin up the links in MPLS between the two path uh, between the two sites. And I also did a uh, an enterprise version of like large scale DM VPN, the the poor man's SD WAN. Uh, um, so that was all managed and orchestrated for a my OSS platform that was hooked up to Stripe. So you put your credit card in and you get an MPLS service on the end of it. It was all virtualized, but um, it was like a, a, a kind of um, uh, see what you could do with APIs at the time. It was my first endeavor into APIs really. So I've got a, I've got a link to send out. It's just a quick question. It's just a multiple choice of saying, uh, what is your level of automation just so I know? what the audience is, etc. So if you could click on that link and I'll get up the results page just so I can see people responding. So hopefully you can see that on the screen. So I've got novice, so uh, an absolute novice and uh, a beginner. So getting hands on the wheel, but you know, falling around at the corners. Um, competent, so we, we're driving along at steady speed now someone who's proficient and then uh, we've got an expert level so hopefully this works and everyone's able to to put some results in um and i'll see if i can refresh it or something oh there we go so we've got some competent just admit that got plenty of novice which is perfectly, perfectly fine. Oh, I can't see who put expert, but someone's going to have put it. It wasn't me. Anyone want to put their hands up? <laughs> um, it definitely wasn't me, Alex. Definitely wasn't oh, me. OK, <laughs> good. Yeah, if anyone has a, a, an answerable question, a salt stack question, June's your, your person to go to. I wish I was that smart. <laughs> awesome. So we've got a number of results in there. So most most of the audience is uh, novice, got some beginner, some competent, so a bit across the board, um, which is good. All right, I'll go back to my presentation. Let's give that one last refresh. There we go. It's the same. Awesome. 
So typically as network engineers, we, we, I remember being at university and that was my first time as being a, 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 like a type of network engineer, really having to set up all my uh, 2900s. And every time I went into the lab, I had to go and, um, you know, we had lectures every every so often. And um, every t every lab session, we would have to go in and the devices would be wiped from the free previous class and we would have to carry on. So it was more got a config template, change some variables, copy and paste. Then that was my first experience, but we do it. We do it now. Um, we do it a lot, and especially as a consultant, I do it a lot. Um, it's, there's nothing wrong with it, really. Um, there's there's a trade off to automating something. You need to put the timing to automate it um, and, and the time to automate it might take longer than it is. And if you're a consultant, um, that Axions uh, provides consultancy. Sometimes we account for the automation. Sometimes we just have to copy and paste there and go a few times because it's only five devices. It's not worth it. But um, at Axions, we try and do everything uh, um, repeatedly. So you get a config template, you'd edit that template, you'd copy and paste it and you'd realize you've put uh, you've put slash 20 floor instead of 255, 255, 255 because you're used to being on Juniper or something like that. Um, and you realize iOS doesn't doesn't have the uh, the, subnet, the small subnet masks. And then your in interaction was the network engineer would directly communicate with the network most of the time. Um, and even when I was, I've been on consultancy for BT, etc., a lot of their systems are like that. You log in and you can only do it from X location and you have to prepare the configs in advance and you get a minute to paste it. And if it goes wrong, roll back <laughs> and then you wait till the next window. Um, uh, and that's typically how it's done uh, and it's not it's not a bad way of doing it of course it's it's really not how it could be um you could edit a file that describes what your network looks like or that could be edit a a, a database um a, a proprietary database a, an open source database something that you've created in uh, um, an excel document that's a database of sorts um edit the data within a, a file uh, of some sort, submit that to a, a source control repository. Um, in this example, we're using Git, but there's different ones like SVN, etc. cetera. Um, the, a lot, most of the time you, you see Git out in industry, um, it's very rare you see any others. You have something that triggers a pipeline, so you, you have a pipeline and a pipeline is some automated tasks that will do bits and bobs for you. It will it will go and generate some configuration from that template you've just changed. It will take the data and ask query another service um, for some information. Uh, and then once all that's done, you can check the results. And now instead of the network engineer directly interfacing with the network, they're interfacing with a workflow engine that uh, can do a lot of the work for them. And there's many different benefits uh, to that. Now, a lot of people see network automation, see all the bits and bobs involved uh, and start running like the, for the hills. Um, and then once you, uh, hopefully by the end of, of today, you would see that the tools are not that scary and there's, there are a lot of them, but you can pin it down quite a lot. Um, and the tools I've selected today are very user friendly as well. And by the end of it, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I understand this now. And uh, and it, a, a switch will flick. So what are the tools? There's many different tools out there, configuration management, You've got Terraform, SaltStack, Puppet, Chef, Ansible. All diff have different ways of working, all have benefits, all have weaknesses, etc. Your version control, you've got different services of source control. You could be 
have have your own source control on a server that's set away somewhere within your organization or you could use a SaaS based service like GitLab, GitHub and, and some of them also have um, self hosted solutions uh, like GOGS or uh, GitLab has a self hosted solution as well because it's open source. You have a number of orchestration tools. These are mainly platforms that have built a workflow engine somewhere within their, their platform and, and can pin a number of tasks together and say, if this succeeds, then do something else. If this fails, do something else. And, and it gets a lot more complex than that, but that, that's a very uh, high level. So you've got Itential, it's a big workflow engine. So within that, you can use Salt, uh, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, Terraform. They have different plugins for all these uh, tools. Stackstorm, it's no one's heard of it until you've heard of it and then realize everyone runs it. Um, it's it, when you peek under the hood, you see the 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 five inches, um, but it goes miles deep. It's it's unreal. Mariana Trench of uh, technology that stacks done. A lot of banks run it for their automation pipelines, etc processing of a lot of data uh, it's, it's a very powerful platform um, Cisco NSO uh, talked about this earlier um, was originally TLF when I worked at Cisco and they acquired it within that period I think was at Cisco a few quite a few years ago now and um, it's come on leaps and bounds um, it uses Yang uh, and uh, different models to be able to model a device and offline be able to model it offline as well as online and look at atomic changes so only change what needs to be changed rather than pushing the whole configuration like you might need to do with some of the device uh, some of the tools i'm going to put others but you've got netbox you've got info blocks you've got many different tools that will that will store or collect information etc Verification tools. You've got IP Fabric that so does network topology um, uh, 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 discovery and uh, validation of, of that data that it discovers and allows you a nice UI. You've also got Batfish, which uh, does the same, but you provide it offline configurations and you use Python to query the data with Batfish. You've got Robot, which is a Python framework to take data and query whether the data within that is is good or not. And you can do a lot of test cases with with Robot. Um, and you've got PyATS. Um, now me and Mark will know PyATS because we used it in in our previous job, Solution Validation Services. But everyone knows it used to be an internal tool at Cisco. Um, and there was a lot of tools around it to manage test cases, etc., uh, within Cisco that hung on the Py ATS platform. And then it was um, not open source, but it's released, um, if I say it that way. They don't let you see the source code, but uh, they let you use it. And it's a very powerful platform to allow you to learn information about the platform, um, do test cases and test validation. You can also uh, interact with um, Ixias, etc., cetera, um, to start chat traffic generation uh, and so forth. There's different libraries out there as well. And libraries are the most powerful um, part of all of this. Every every vendor product or tool you see on here will have a library and those libraries are the most important part of the whole thing and allow you to interact with all of these devices so PyATS is built up of a number of libraries that you can consume. Um, PyATS might use a SSH uh, library under the hood which might be NetMiko for example etc. Um, Ansible, let's say, uses NetMiko under the hood for a certain amount of modules that it has. It's a very, libraries are used everywhere and you can just search on GitHub of something you want to do and there might be something out there that will do it. Caprica, it's supposed to be called Caprica, but uh, someone misspelt it when they created the, uh, the, the repository on GitHub apparently. Uh, it's, 
it's a library not many people have heard of it but this is for acl generation so you define acls in a text file and you say okay spit it out to ios and it'll push out loads of ios acl commands and then you go hold on i've, I've just got rid of my ios box change it to junos bam you got a junos firewall configuration out the box Paprika is a very powerful tool. Not many people know about it. I like to uh, talk about that one. Um, we've used it on many projects built into CICD pipelines that takes a file of policies and generates it into different formats depending on the vendor. Um, it's created by Google. Google uses it internally um, and it supports many vendors. Network telemetry, being able to find, debug and get information out of your devices. I won't be talking about that much today, but it's used everywhere. Everyone knows uh, Syslog, SNMP, etc. You can also stream telemetry these days so you can get real time informa information. Um, we see a lot of customers using this to try and find out micro bursts, etc. It's a real problem in the industry of being able to get data when the, the device is being hammered. Um, so there's Influx Telegraph. Influx is a time series database. Telegraph is a piece of uh, uh, software that written in Go that uh, allows you to take multiple inputs and translate them into multiple outputs. So you can say, I want Syslog to go to Prometheus. I want Syslog to go to Influx. I want Syslog to go to whatever you want. Uh, there'll be something out there for you. And Prometheus, that little flame icon, is a uh, is a uh, uh, another time series database. And network virtualization, going to use a bit of that, but it's good to lab up, test things, and I think it's very powerful for network automation. And there's a lot more. Oh, I'm not going to go through this one, but um, as you can see, the DevOps world has a lot of tools, um, but you just need to look at what you want to focus on and focus on those ones. Um, but there's a lot and they all have different use cases. So I've got another question to send out to you, and that is um, what tools you're looking into and what for? Hopefully it works. I tried to get it to, to be embedded, but um, apparently laptop doesn't like polls being embedded in PowerPoints. I'll try and find my page that has the results for that survey. I'll just continually refresh it. Hopefully the link works. I'll click on it just to give it a test. Ah, there we go. What software do you want to try out and what are you looking to achieve with that software? There you go. Someone said uh, Caprica, multi multi vendor firewall uh, policy generation, testing ACL deployment. Two on there, I think. Has, it, has anyone just realized what this tool is and be like, yep, I want to see just that now? <laughs> Ansible deployment. Awesome. Internally looking to understand what aspects of automation might be applicable to our workflows. No specific software yet. Deployment mainly. OK. Wait for a few more to come in. So multiple pages or have we just not got many respondents? Awesome, I'll move on in a minute. It's half past 11.
Yeah, nothing in yet. I'll have a look later if anyone gets to it later. So I have set up a, a, a demo. Um, it's a very primitive demo. It, get, it has the basics to be able to test some functionality. It's not by no means a full solution that would be production ready. Um, it kind of looks like this. Um, I have put some validation um, before the push of the configuration and after the push, um, push of the configuration, but um, it's very primitive. Um, I did it this morning in a few minutes. Um, uh, the, the workflow uh, will look like the following. It will have a validation stage. This is where we validate that the user's input is correct on some level. Um, it's valid YAML um, and we'll talk about what YAML is in a minute because for some people I'll be talking uh, nonsense. Um, we'll validate that an the Ansible configuration files are correct. So it's important that right libraries, we are using industry, uh, not industry stand standard, but recommended um, uh, lines within the configuration and, and it validates other bits like make sure white space is, is all that. It's kind of like a syntax check and a linter um, all in one. We then uh, build the configuration. So this gathers uh, this process, this step within the process um, will check the device connectivity, it will gather some facts about that device, it will back up the existing configuration, it will create a directory structure just to pump out uh, the, the desired config when it builds a config from the templates uh, and it builds the, the desired configuration within those, um, within those directories and then it takes that data and pushes the configuration to the device. Now have a, a mix of Juniper and uh, uh, Cisco. So there's uh, two different two different vendors in there, but it could be as many as you want. And I'll talk about what um, what products or what um, software we're using shortly. A detailed workflow would look something like this. You'd update a variable within a YAML file somewhere, you'd commit it, you'd validate it, and then you'd do a bunch of stuff that kind of like what I've just said. Um, you'd do some checks, you would do some um, pre-checks, post-checks, and then if the checks uh, are not valid, you'd roll back uh, of some sort. Now the rollback can be quite complicated depending on the vendor you've got, but there's different workarounds for different things. For example, if you've got Juniper, you could just do rollback one, commit, and then um, you're back to the previous config. But you have to know what you have to know what uh, rollback you were at. Well, if there's multiple pipelines running at once, um, it can be get, get quite complicated. You merge if if those checks are successful, you'd merge the branch. Um, someone would peer review it. Um, so make sure that you get someone to look at it and you can only merge the branch which once all you can set it so that once you all your checks are passed, you can then merge the branch um, into production. This kind of expects that you've got a uh, kind of people like to use the word digital twin of your network, but no one ever does. Um, whether you uh, and that's why virtualization is quite good. If you can try and get a good virtualization estate uh, up and running to mimic as much of your estate as possible, then within the with before we commit to production, you can test those changes against your uh, staging environment or uh, your kind of digital twin. Um, some customers don't have this, so you have to kind of work around it. One might be that you use an offline configuration tool like Batfish to analyze the, the configurations you've generated um, and you push the information into Batfish. You run some queries on that to make sure that routing might still um, work, etc., and do offline validation. Um, some, some customers have lit their check processes. Does it do a commit? Um, a commit check on on Junos, and that was one of our customers. What they wanted to do, they wanted to do a commit check. If it if it's a valid configuration, it should pass the commit check. Um, means there's no syntax problems, etc. It doesn't validate the uh, the routing works, though. That's 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 one of the downsides. So that's why you need good uh, 
pre and post checks. And again, once once it's been reviewed, you'd aim to then push it in production and, and you'd do the same the same steps on the right hand side, get device pre-checks, build config, etc. You'd do all that um, again, but in production. Now people might be saying, well, how do I do that? Um, now, firstly, you've got to select your weapons. Um, there's a lot out there. A lot of a lot are um, better than others in for specific purposes, and some are easier to get started than others. Um, there's a lot of configuration management tools out there. Um, I'll be looking at one, but don't 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 take it as gospel. It's it's a very easy one to get going, but it does have limitations depending on what you're trying to do. So my choices for this demo, GitLab. Um, I'll talk about why I'm using GitLab. Um, Axions pay for it. Uh, that's about it. It could be any other platform, but uh, Axions pay for a GitLab and it has the premium features that that has, whatever they are. Um, but that's where we put all of our code. Uh, I use VS Code. I use that to edit my um, text documents or YAML files, etc. And it also allows you to get some around some um, different bits and pieces. Uh, Docker, Docker will be used. I don't know how far I'm going to go into Docker, but the process requires building a Go custom container to uh, run CICD pipeline. So we'll see how we get on with that. And Ansible. I'm using Ansible because it's good to get started very early. A lot of our uh, customers tend to use Ansible because a lot of their server teams use Ad Ansible, so they want to standardize on a specific platform. Um, uh, th so the majority of our customers have have done Ansible training and then used, started using Ansible for many different reasons, deploying servers, deploying network um, services, etc. Um, it's a very popular one, very easy to get going. It doesn't require you to know Python um, too much. Um, it's very, uh, it's got a DSL, a domain specific language. It's like a, a text file that you, you you type out and it understands what you're, you're trying to achieve. I've got PyATS down there, but that's since been removed. I, I just use Ansible to do the same function because I had some issues with PyATS this morning. Um, and for Ansible, we'll be using, obviously Ansible uses Python. It, it's written in Python and uh, we'll be using something called a virtual environment. And I'll talk about what that is in a minute. So if you were a network engineer, like I am, um, I primarily am, um, you'd learn how to install the bits and bobs. Now, you can't do a request system package add. Um, it's not a Juniper device. It, uh, most of the time you'll be working on Windows, Linux, Mac, etc. Everyone has a different way of installing something, um, just like a, a, a network device. So it's a bit different. A lot of the challenges we've had with training uh, people in, in network automation is that um, Linux Linux is the biggest one. People, a lot of people don't don't know Linux. Um, but it, when you're getting more into the DevOps side and software development, Linux and and um, Unix are, are, are very good skills to have of knowing where files are located, um, how to locate a hidden file because a lot of files that uh, used these days are, are hidden for repositories and I can show those in a minute. And then learn the do tools. Um, I learned by reading the documentation, watching videos on YouTube, attending training sessions, uh, and then building a lab and get going. That's why I put the slides up earlier about virtualization. You can get Cisco modeling labs, you could get GNS3, Eve, um, Eve uh, a lot of different virtualization platforms out there that allow you to get going with very minimal effort. And there's also SaaS services out there will, that will host labs for you, um, which is uh, what I've, I had a lot of friends do at university. So first off, before I start looking at code, we're going to talk about some Ansible basics. Now, I pinched this from my, my uh, uh, a training course that we have. Uh, some information's there, some not. I did a 
copy and paste pretty much. Um, and I think it's good to understand Ansible before I start showing you code because uh, else you won't know what's going on. Any questions so far? Just speak up if you have any. OK. So Ansible. At its core, it's a, an automation engine and it has four main components. It has a, an inventory module, has a CLI, which is how we interact with it, kind of like a network device if, if you're used to that. We've got modules. So these are your uh, different protocols, I would say, if putting in network times. They do different things. They achieve a different outcome. And we have plugins. They're things that you can customize yourself, change, implement, etc. Modules have kind of been renamed collections as well. So when you're looking at documentation, you'll see modules and collections come hand in hand. And how do you interact with uh, this automation engine? You create something called a playbook. A playbook is like a workflow. It will execute tasks sequentially um, when invoked. Um, so if you say task one, task two, task three, it will run those in order on the host that you've uh, specified. So if you've got three hosts, it will run through task A um, on those three hosts. Once they're all completed, it will move to the next um, task and complete all those hosts. You can change the order, but you have to go into the config and, and change it. It's not too difficult if you want a different way of uh, ordering, but that's the main thing. It's top to bottom. Um, uh, and a playbook is is how you interact with Ansible. A playbook looks like this. It's a text file. It's very human readable, as we like to call it. And it's something called YAML. Uh, I think it stands for yet another markup language because there's many markup languages and I think they run out of names. Um, You'll see some key components of this at the top, very top. You've got three hyphens that just indicates that um, it's, it's a YAML file. And then you've got some different formatting down the uh, side here. The, the formatting is a bit off the, the pitch of tool didn't quite capture it, but it should be a little bit different. Um, but the general gist is there. We have a name. That's the name of the playbook at the top. So we, this playbook here is called install and start Apache. Um, we're going to run it on a certain amount of devices within our, in, within our inventory. And the, those are the web hosts. Um, so it might be a group. It might be a singular host, um, whatever you've called web within your inventory. Become just allows you to become a pseudo user or privilege user. And then you have tasks. Uh, it's hard to tell here. There's like a hyphen in front of the name under tasks. Um, that indicates that this is a uh, list or a sequence, as, as YAML likes to call it. Um, and within those tasks, you have a number of tasks. You've got three tasks there. HTTP pack, uh, package is present, so we're making sure we install the HTTPD package. Then we've got a task to make sure our index.html file is present. And then we've got one to make sure that the process is started. So the modules, the modules are what um, the, run, the, the task you want to run. So in this example, head template is the module we're running. In the previous one, yum template and service are the modules that we're running. I'll go through quickly because we want to get onto some live stuff. Um, Plugins are allow you to manipulate data uh, within the Ansible engine, and they allow you to format data, process data, split data up, and do whatever you, you want with it, really. You can make custom plugins to do some cool stuff. Um, I had an example where a customer wanted to do a live um, BGP query and see what routes are being advertised from specific services on the internet, so like who is. Um, so we had a custom filter that would do a who is request, get all the IP addresses from the who is request and put them into a Juniper um, address book uh, for an SRX so that we can dynamically every time it's run, it will go and dynamically find the live IPs, things like that you can do with um, plugins. An inventory, it's a text file and it allows you to list the devices that you want to communicate to. 
and uh, most of the time also indicate the how to connect to that device. So you can either connect via host name or an IP address and then the username, password, etc. You can talk to cloud, we won't be doing that. You can talk to CMDBs, we won't be doing that, etc. Now, quick one on JSON and YAML. Um, there is a need for it. Com um, computers need to talk to um, computers, so they have like their own language. Um, most of the time, it's like JSON, but you'll see like other ones coming out, like G gRPC, etc. Um, there is a need to structure data, so you need different structures for um, different applications. Um, the, the main ones are uh, XML, JSON, YAML, and uh, JSON and YAML are very similar if you've ever used JSON. So I've, on the left hand side here, I've got JSON, but I've got the same representation on the right hand side in YAML. So if you're used to JSON or, for example, you use the Juniper CLI, you'll be used to seeing an output that's uh, fairly similar. Oh, sorry, fairly similar to this. Um, and on the right hand side is the same representation. Um, YAML is a superset of J, uh, JSON, so anything you can do in, in um, in JSON, you can do in YAML, but you can't do it the other way around. For example, YAML, you can have comments. You can't do that in, in um, JSON. And a few other things like references, etc. And I'll show you some cool stuff we can do that with that, um, like referencing data in another place. Why this is important um, to talk about is JSON and YAML's, YAML is used in a lot of things you'll do with network automation. So for example, JSON, Junos configuration, um, Juniper operational command outputs for JSON. In YAML, you've got PyEZ that uses YAML. You've also got a number of libraries that use YAML as the, um, as the language to use, like Ansible, uh, for example. So for example, you can see here uh, how um, a, a PyEZ library, a Juniper library, uses YAML to determine uh, what a BGP table looks like. And ex I've got an example. Now, why Git allows us to um, have organic contributions. Yeah, it allows us to see the logs from all the different um, users that are interacting with the platform. We can do diffs so we can see, oh, this person, um, what they've changed within a certain time period and say, okay, from a week ago, all this data has been changed. Um, you can enforce workflow so you can say, okay, we can't merge to master until, master or main uh, until um, the pipeline has been successfully run uh, at least once. So you can say, don't push a broken configuration to the network, let's say. Um, you can enforce reviews, make sure people peer review your work. Uh, and the main one we're looking at is CICD. So being able to um, uh, trigger a platform, um, a pipeline to do something for us. There's many different platforms that, that have CICD, GitLab, GitHub, GOGS. There's, there's loads of, uh, there's loads. Azure has one, et cetera. Um, you, there's multiple out there. If you've got a platform, you probably pay for something that does CICD already somewhere like Azure. Simple to deploy. Um, that's why I've used Git, GitLab. We we pay for it internally and we use it internally, so it's it's pretty familiar for me to get going on it pretty quickly. Um, you can trigger a pipeline on many events. So you can say when someone commits, when someone submits a pull request, um, like so wants to contribute towards your code. You can say when we only want to merge into master. We can say skip. If, if someone's put a specific word in a commit message, et cetera. And you can um, set different conditions from push it for pushing into main, which allows for the auditability and, and making sure things don't go wrong. And I think the last one is uh, why network is code. Mainly you can templatize all of your data. The reasons for this, so you might have a standard BGP config across the network. Now, instead of going and going on text editor, copy and paste, doing your import export policies, creating your route maps, etc., um, you can create one BGP template, verif 
verify what that data looks like uh, and then generate a configuration based on that. And we do, I'm showing something similar within this where we have a few devices that have OSPF. I define what OSPF looks like once and the different devices use a different variation of the data. Not everything I've done is templatized. Um, I've done specific things um, just to make uh, the demo smaller. Template re rendering is completed in the pipeline. So the live device configurations will be built during the pipeline, which is good. So they're, they're up to date, standardized. And what a lot of people do, a lot of um, the organizations we work with, is every time the pipeline runs, it will overwrite whatever is on the device. So anything that is, um, if someone's made a CLI change, it will overwrite it um, because they want this um, platform to be the source of truth for them uh, and you can integrate other platforms into it like netbox etc so you can query from netbox during the process process of creating the, dev the device templates um, to make this possible and you can get the templates back which is awesome um, you can see them so i'm about to show you how it's done well hopefully we'll see okay Okay, let's get the right browser up. I'll minimize that, minimize that. Okay. Okay, so I have two schools of thought. I can start programming it, programming it from scratch, or I can show you a pre-made thing that's, that's there um, and start pulling in code from that I've already created. What would people like me to do, like start from scratch or or uh, go from a pre-existing demo? Um, unmute and and say what you think. It's kind of high risk if I, I do it live, but um, you'll probably understand it a lot more. Anyone got a preference? Yeah, would it be uh, more logical to show it step by step as you as you write it, just to make yep. life difficult? <laughs> yeah, that's perfectly fine. That's also that's perfectly fine. Okay, so I'll do that. Okay, so first thing I want to do is everything we want to do will will want to be version controlled. So this is my GitLab. You can see some info there, but we'll I give that a miss. Um, we want to create a blank project. And yeah, I'll call it um, Axions Alive. Uh, let's lowercase it demo. Okay, I'll pick a namespace to put in. Just we group things here. Oh, I'll put uh, yeah, put it under uh, group. Uh, I'll create a public so. Uh, anyone can see what what's happening on here and we'll press uh, create project that's how easy it is to create a git repository um it's the same in github um so that's github.com uh, it looks similar you just press new um and it gives you the same information basically is it public is it private what information do you want to put in there so it's, it's very similar between the platforms git is is um very uh, the same now normally to interact with repositories that you've created you need an ssh key um, and if you're a networking person you surely you should know what an ssh key allows us to log into devices securely um, using a, an encrypted key rather than using an password so git or any service requiring git will require that um, you can do it username and password, but um, you'd have to put the username and password in every time. So I've got this repository, I'll press clone, and I've got a, uh, a terminal up here, and I'll press new folder. Oh, I won't actually do that. I'll go into terminal. So this is Visual Studio Code, so anyone who hasn't seen Visual Studio Code, um, it's a text editor, very powerful tool. And it allows you to have terminal, see devices, etc., uh, see your text files, etc., but also do funky highlighting and etc. What you want. So I'll just go back and I'll do git clone, 
and then press git clone and this will pull that repository that i've just created on github that sits on the in gitlab that sits on the internet and create it locally so we could do um cd so it does change in directory if anyone's not familiar with linux and we'll go back into that um, repository i use linux for my development i am on a windows machine um, but i used um, linux the the reason why is a lot of um, um, Python services will not sometimes be made to run on a on a Windows environment. It's got a lot better since people um, uh, since Windows released the Windows subsystem for Linux. I've never used it because I just have um, servers uh, running that I kind of do all my development on that can run Docker etc. Um, so. Uh, I will be using Linux, but um, you can do most of the things I'm doing today on uh, on a Windows machine or a Mac. OK, so we've got that data here, so I'll just press refresh here. And we'll see that that file come in here so we can start not using the CLI. So you can see here this is the same file that is on our on our file. So we can see it says Axion's live demo getting started. And if we go to our code, it says Axion's live demo getting started. Now, if I want to change something, I'll say hi, live demo. And if I press save, it will not show up in this platform. There's a process to to get to to allow you to submit changes and it's called the, the commit process. There's also branches. I won't be talking about the details in Git, but. Um, uh, VS Code allows it to be very easy. So you can go into here and you can say, I've never used this to be honest, but uh, oh, there we go. There we go. So it says I've made a change. It shows me what that change is. I can press the little add button. I can enter a commit message. So update, read me. And then I can press tick. And then if I do um, sync changes, and then when I go back onto this platform here, we'll see that that platform is there. So you don't need to know the CLI commands. Uh, you can do it mostly through through um, Visual Studio Code. OK, so we want to start programming with Ansible. So we need a few things. I want to show you where to get the information from. So um, we don't need that anymore. So docs.ansible.com latest. If you go to this platform, it'll give you all the information you need, a user guide, the, they have an installation guide. Uh, any platform you've got, it'll tell you how to install it. Very simple. I know how to install it myself, so I'll be doing that. I'll make sure I've got Python installed and I'll be doing something called um, creating a virtual environment. Uh, a virtual environment allows you to have different uh, dependencies depending on where you're working. So we can go CD, uh, source, then being active. So this means that anything within this, um, within this virtual environment is separate from the rest of my virtual machine. That allows me to work on multiple projects at the same time and have different dependency requirements for each of my customers. Um, Ansible uses um, many different ways to install. You can do apt get um, install. But, um, Python has a package manager that's called pip. You can do pip install Ansible. And it should install. So here we go. Might take a little while, it's a bit big. Hopefully it doesn't um, kill the internet. <laughs> Most of it's cached anyway, which is good. OK, there we go. So now we could do Ansible dash dash version and we can see that we've got Ansible 2.13.2 installed, um, Python version 3.10.6 uh, and Ginger version 3.1.2. So we can see that Ansible's running. Uh, we've got Ansible installed. It was that simple, about three commands and we're in. Um, very, very good. I bet you can't see me on there. I've put my, I've got multiple screens, so uh, 
Uh, I'm uh, putting down. I'll swap uh, now. I'll keep that up there on the bigger screen. OK, so first off, we need an inventory. We need to know what devices to talk to. So we will. What I'm going to do is create a folder called Ansible. Um, this just allows me to have um, separation depending on what I'm doing with the project. So I've got Ansible and I'm going to create an, uh, an inventory file. The inventory file will have a bunch of information in uh, of what our devices are. So we'll go inventory.yaml. Now, dot, it, I'm doing .yaml, you can do .ino, there's multiple different formats, and you can even to Ansible to go and query a, a third party like IP Fabric, like um, Netbox for dynamic inventory. Uh, so if you want to add to your database a new device, Ansible will pick that up automatically and start generating, uh, start doing its automation processes. So not going to bore you with this, but um, I'll copy and paste a pre-made one I have. This is a directory structure that tells um, Ansible that I have a, two, a few groups. The groups are called routers and switches. So if I want to just work on uh, do automation on routers, I can say just do it on routers and say routers. And within the group of routers, we have hosts. We have a few hosts here. We've got PE, um, the provider edge got uh, R1, R2, the provider edge is iOS, the R1, R2 are Junos, and our switch is uh, also iOS. Juniper don't provide a switching on virtual estates other than the QFX. Um, so that's what an inventory looks like. It can be more simple than this, it can be more complex. And you can also, these, these things here are variables, so we're saying the host name is PE, but the, the IP address is um, is 10.192.168.8.10. Uh, the reason why I'm doing this is because I don't have a um, domain, uh, a DNS server in my like my lab, so it's difficult to look up those IP addresses. So I've assigned them manually, but most of the time we don't do that with our customers because it's a production environment, got got DNS everywhere. I've also put the type of the device and I've put this in there so that I can select what templates to pick and choose from um, depending on these variables, these variables here. Um, so we, it'll, it'll say, OK, this is a, a router, but we've got two Juniper devices here and this one's configured as a firewall and this one's configured as a router. So it allows us to just diff pick different configurations because um, the VSRX have, have, has um, uh, flow mode and um, packet mode. And we've got switch. This just allows us to pick our switch config. OK. It's very simple. That's that's the basics of, of an inventory. What you can do then is do Ansible inventory. So most of the time someone will put information in here and we'll see that it, it doesn't work. Uh, so we've just put an intentional typo in here. Let's see if that breaks something. Inventory. Uh, we just got change directory, uh, Ansible, Ansible inventory. There's many Ansible commands, so you just do Ansible tab tab and it will show you all of the commands. You do Ansible uh, inventory dash I, uh, dash I will let you select your inventory. Uh, you'll get familiar with it with Ansible and then you can do dash dash list. And we can see here that there's an there's an error. It's failed to pass it because of an error and it's kind of trying to suggest where that error is at the moment. Now I've, I've introduced that error, but when it works, we should get something that looks like this. It's a JSON file. So we've gone <laughs> from YAML to JSON. Um, it's, it's a JSON dictionary. So uh, we can see the host files and we've got our host name DMZ. That's our DMZ switch. Uh, the information's there. So if I want to add a bit more information, say, um, site address and say it's in Reading uh, Green Park. If I press list, now that data is available to Ansible via the, those host files. Um, someone got a question. 
high risk. That, that was ages ago. That was when you said, uh, uh, oh, should, should, should we do it as a, a high risk <laughs> from scratch uh, or a new one? Uh, no, no, that's fine. We're, we'll get to a point and then we'll look at uh, the, the pre-made one. So it's good to get this uh, good going. So now what we can do is look about how we're going to um, log into these devices. So Ansible has a many different ways to log into a device. You can use their built-in modules to log into a device, which we are going to use here, so the simplest way. And by default, you just provide the, the vendor of that device. And um, you can go online and just Google uh, Ansible Docs and then Network OS. Uh, and it will give you a list somewhere. I found it earlier. So you can see here. See here, there's EOS, iOS, VOS, the VIOS, um, and there's different ones. There is there is a big list somewhere. Uh, here we go of the different platforms they su support. So someone, everyone in this uh, call has probably got a device that sits within here and Ansible natively can talk to that device. Um, so Dell, Cloud Engine, Cisco, et cetera. Um, so we, we tell it that what device it is and uh, there we go to go. Anyone know what else we're missing from here? I'll say it, it's the credentials. We don't know what to log in with, uh, which brings us on to a good point of, um, of variables. How do we assign multiple variables to a lot of different devices? Ansible well has two different forms of, uh, has many forms of doing that. I think there's like 11 ways of assigning variables um, and each have different precedences. Um, but the main ones are group vars. So if you create a a folder called group vars and you can create a folder called host vars host underscore vars host vars are variables specific to a spe um, variables that are to a specific host and group vars are to group so you could say uh, routers you could say all etc so i'm going to create a folder called all and within all i'm just going to put creds.yml and i could put my credentials in here I could say um, my username and password, uh, etc. Now let me see what I did on my previous one because usable. So you want Ansible underscore username, and that'll be like Axions and Ansible underscore password and everyone has their own password default um, for our labs we we just do this for our training labs etc um, so we have that anyone know what's bad with this anyone see this sort of form is that publicly accessible is that um, published in the uh, repository yes if I commit that it's available for everyone to see yeah, ideally we want to encrypt that uh, and you can encrypt it. Uh, one second, so it's been in. And you can, you can encrypt it by using something called Ansible Vault. So Ansible Vault is, um, is a, a tool that allows you to uh, encrypt and decrypt, uh, um, encrypt and decrypt files and it will encrypt and decrypt YAML files, etc. Um, and once you encrypt it, uh, you need to put your password back in to unencrypt it. So for example, you could do Ansible, back, Ansible Vault uh, encrypt uh, and then specify your file, I think it is. So you do group vars. If I can spell uh, all creds and it'll say uh, if I typed in right 
missing an R in encrypt. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so new vault password. So I'll just give it a, a password that I know. And now when you look at this file, it will change. It's gone to um, a random string. And uh, group files. Oh. Yep, so I what I need to do is edit this file because I've typoed something inside it. So you do decrypt. Uh, yes, crypt. And you put your password in. And then you'll be able to see that file again. I'll just refresh it so it's it's Ansible underscore user. And the password and uh, Ansible underscore password. You can you don't have to encrypt it and decrypt it, um, but if you want to use a text editor, you you need to. You can. I'll show you this way. You could do Ansible Vault Edit and then group vars or creds and then if you put your password in it'll bring it up in like the 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 um linux default uh, text editor and then you can edit and when it saves it re-encrypts it um so that's an easy way of doing it anything we do in production uh, that has credentials it's either in an encrypted ansible vault file or it's in um or it's in uh another typo um it's in environment variables that are passed down into the docker containers when it runs okay so let's start making a, a let's get to the juicy stuff because uh, we want to start making a, a a task that does something okay so we've got group files got our credentials and if we do ansible i think ansible uh inventory so it says now we can't look at our inventory because there's encrypted variables in there so you can do ask vault pass and what that'll do is when you run that command it'll ask you for the vault password and then it'll give you it and it shows it does show the passwords in here but um you can see it's added those because it's in the group all it's added it to every device okay so let's create a new one. We'll create a playbook. Uh, I call it pb dot. Um, back, let's do backup dot uh, yaml. So we want to backup the device. So it's a yaml file. We'll do dot, dot uh, dash dash dash. So we we'll do name backup um, backup uh, devices, and then we want to do uh, hosts. Uh, so we'll just do all we want to do the group all we can see here that that, that group um there's a group all that contains all of the, the switches uh, and routers um connection uh, we'll do network underscore cli there's different connectivity types so for example juniper wants netconf um, it can do cli network cli but it prefers uh, netconf um, and i've enabled netconf so i'll show you how to get around that so by default we'll do network cli uh, we could do netconf and change the cisco devices but we'll just do, stick it with this way at the minute so network cli so that's how it's going to connect to the device we'll do um, gather facts false what ansible will do is it'll try and learn about the devices when it first um, connects to them it'll try and run a bunch of commands and get data about them and put it into the ansible variables sometimes you don't want that because it does take a little bit to run um, so most of the time i just disable it and do it when i need it um, so next uh, we can do um, some tasks so uh, create some tasks now I don't know the 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 the, the module of, off the back of my hand to use, especially for Cisco. So let's go and have a look. Cisco, Cisco iOS config Ansible. I look at that. Oh, look at that. The first one that comes up, 
cisco.ios.ios underscore config dot module. Now, if you look at this, I like to show this within it because it, it shows how I find the information, which helps um, a bunch of, helps people uh, find the information. So this module accepts a bunch of parameters after backup, backup options, dir paths, file name before, etc. Now they won't make sense to anyone. What I do is go right to the bottom, examples, and look at the examples. Once you know how modules are then structured, you'll know how to use those parameters. So what I, when you're starting out, just go straight to the examples, have a look, and they, they name the task. So configure top level configuration. So OK, this one says it's applying a line of host name and then supplying a variable, which is what we've configured the host name in, in, um, in Ansible, in the Ansible inventory. Configure an interface, so it's doing just um, it, OK, so it's got one called parents. If you go and see what parents says, it says uh, it runs this before the other things get run, basically. So it runs this Ethernet eth interface Ethernet one, and then it runs the line configurations under that parent interface. As we know, Cisco has hierarchy of, of its configuration. Um, so we could do configure IP helper, um, etc. So what we would want to do is just do a backup. Hello, so is there a backup? Anything? That, oh, yeah. Configure backup path. OK, so. I'll copy that. Paste it here and make sure the formatting. So if anyone ever anyone getting started, it's the bane of everyone's life. Um, YAML uses spaces for indentations, uh, not tabs. You can get VS Code that does like when you press tab, it puts spaces in. Um, you can get things that do that. So I can say. Backup, yes. I don't want to source sources if I'm going to push devices. So backup, yes. And there's something like uh, backup options. This is the one I didn't copy it. So backup options. And we can see that these parameters go under indented under that configuration module, but the backup options go within one deeper. They go under the backup options. Backup options then belongs to the module. We can do backup.cfg. Now, um, I'll just do, uh, I'll put a variable in here. So to select a variable, we do some um, rotations and double braces. We do, um, we could do uh, playbook underscore DIR, I think it is. And that will save it to wherever we've run the playbook from. So let's give that a go and see if anyone can spot my configuration error from what I said earlier about how Ansible runs. Bonus points if you get pick it up. OK, so this is how we run an, a playbook, Ansible playbook. Let me see if I can zoom in on that. Well, that's a, I can't, I can't, it's too big for me to see. Um, ask, so Ansible playbook, we select the inventory, or oh, I've not select the inventory there, inventory.yaml. Then we select the playbook we want to run, so pb.playbook. And then ask uh, vault. Pass. Uh, when it runs, it'll ask us our password. And it says there's a bunch of Python modules that are not installed. Way. So do pip install, and it's saying Python module Paramico is not installed. So let's install that. Run that again. It's a lot of troubleshooting. OK, so now it says the authenticity of the host. Many people have got this. You're trying to say to say, so you can't authentic, uh, authentic, do the authenticity. So how you get around that is there's a, an Ansible configuration. Um, you can create a file within the, the directory called ansible.cfg. And then if you put uh, configuring and uh, there's a thing called host key checking. Let me find it. So under defaults, you just do that. And then do axioms one to three. So it now says there's another one not installed. 
So if it passed, it used Paramico, but it was trying to use this ansible.lib uh, pylib ssh. So I'll just install that, that so it gets rid of the warning. Run again. Oh, I put the wrong password in. And again. So it's gone to all four devices and tried to back them up. So we've got backup.cfg. So does anyone see what my issue was? Did anyone spot it? Have you told it where it's going to put the backups? Have you got a TFTP server or something? Yeah, no. So I've, I've told it to put it in the playbook directory. So it saved it here as an under um, uh, backup.cfg, but there's only one file, but I've got four devices. Well, two Cisco devices. The other ones will fail. Oh, are they overwriting the same file? Exactly, yeah. So that because I've called it backup.cfg, and because, the, as I said earlier, it will run a task and run that same task for all devices. So if you don't make it dif different uh, within this, um, within this uh, string here, it will try and um, just save it. Um, so what we can do is just create a new folder. We'll do uh, output just so it's a bit easier and we'll delete that backup there just so it's gone. What you'd normally do is have all that whole process automated so it creates the output directory, etc. So we'll do output forward slash and then we can do braces and we do inventory underscore hostname. So this is a built in, you can Google built in um, Ansible variables. Um, so we do inventory house name dot backup dot cfg. There we go. That will work. And again, as you said, um, if you've got a an FTP server or an N NFS share or something like that, um, it will um, I've put the wrong thing. Host name. It will um, if you've got like an NFS share, it'll save it to whatever directory you're trying to go to. So I just fix my typo there. And we can see here if we go to output now we've got a few we've got a config for each device. How cool is that? I, I'm surprised it worked for the um, Juniper devices because I've said run the Cisco, run the Cisco module, but it's even worked. It's figured out that that's a different device automatically and automatically run the right commands that it needs to do. Very interesting. Never seen that before. So that's a way of of um, creating a quick a quick playbook to do something like that. Um, so you can also do conditional. So you can say when um, uh, you could say like iOS equals um, Uh, what did we call it? Right, so you can say network, uh, network OS. So here we go. In. This might not work, it'll fail. Um, and you do a conditional like that. Uh, I'm blinding on that one at the minute. One sec. Oh, it's because I did these. So it needs to be that, 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 that. Axioms, what do you And now I'll say skipping because the first two te the first two devices don't match the iOS criteria. So it's only running against the iOS devices. So I said if it's in the network OS. So when you get into it, um I've, I've mistyped that as well there's another one i mistyped um when you get into it you'll you'll start getting a feel for the how ansible works etc and then you can start building in so it it gets a lot a lot bigger and i'll, I'll um pull up my pre-made one with uh, only a few minutes to go um so one second so we do source because i've got a virtual environment source then have been activate Principle playbook um, do dash i inventory. 
Dash playbook, dash I inventory. And now I've got one called PB dot um, common, for example. And if I run this, ask uh, vault uh, pass axions. So what this is then doing, it does. There's, there's a lot that's happening within this. It's checking that it can reach to the device before it starts doing anything else. It will start gathering facts about the device, create a backup directory. It will then start generating configs and then try and push those configs to the 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 um, the uh, devices. So it did push it then. So let's see here. Um, and I'll show you what this looks like, what this playbook looks like. It's less than what we had earlier. Um, anyone have an idea of what we're using here, where it says here, um, roles? Anyone have an idea of what roles might be? Well, they're reusable um, snippets of, of tasks that you want to pull in or take out of, of a playbook. They're reusable. So we have a role here, let's say set up directories. We go to roles, set up directories, and we have tasks in there. And this is a, just a list of tasks. So this makes sure that the directories are present for when we start making the files. We also get more complicated in here when we have generate configurations. And this is where we start templatizing configuration. So we have one task in here that generates the config, but we have templates. Now I have a template folder called Cisco iOS iOS and within there I have router.config.conf.j2 and then we can see it's a full Cisco config and I've parameterized some of it. I've not done it all just because that would be a, a lot of effort. Um, but I've done things like interfaces, so I've included the template for interfaces um, so we can see what an interface look, the interface template looks like. It looks like this. It looks a bit of a mess. Um, but this is called a, like a ginger. Uh, it's a templating language. And what it does is it allows you to select and loop through variables as if it were kind of like code to generate a structured output. Um, and where it's getting these data from, as we talked about earlier, host files. I've created host files for like router one. So I've got interfaces here router one and this loops this is interfaces so i have a, a number of interfaces name ge00 unit family ip address it can get a lot complicated than this but this is the most basic you can have like mpls you can have import export um, etc um in cisco you could have uh, ip nat etc i've got that i've got that in here uh, i've got a nat config in here i've got um other bits and pieces. Now, this is what I wanted to show you earlier with YAML. We can define an interface type of, say, enabled false. So we want like a a, a default a default um, configuration for our, our interfaces, and we can say when Gigabit Ethernet two is created, we can vet like um, reference a, a dictionary before that has been created. So at default. And it will apply all these variables to that interface. So you can say by default it's it's false, it's not enabled, um, and the uh, speed duplex, etc. And it will map that variable to these uh, the interfaces. And then you can override bits and pieces. So you can say, oh, we actually want to enable that. So you do enabled true. Uh, and then within your um, uh, template file. If I go back to templates, so you can see here interfaces, name, enabled, etc. So if we go to iOS interfaces, we say we go, we look through the interfaces. So for interfaces in interfaces, select the name. Is virtual assembly uh, enabled? Is NAT enabled? Is media type enabled, etc. And we put that configuring configuration in. And when it's done, it will spit out a configuration. Um, let me see what we've got one here. So it'll spit out, oh, this is the Junos one, and it'll spit out um, 
the configuration here. And then we take that configuration, push it to the device. Now we've got a few minutes left. Once you have all these processes in um, Ansible defined, so we can run it locally and it runs uh, really well. Uh, we've just run it there and it pushed some changes to the device. So I'll just get rid of that out of there. And what we can do is say, I'm going to introduce a change to the network and then we'll see it be um, completed. Uh, and then um, we'll talk about what uh, what is causing that to happen in CICD. So if I go to host vars, if I go to router one, I go to policy options. I've got some policy statements here that just do some importing and exporting for BGP. So if I say, OK, we want to reject the BGP from our peer, reject. Someone's fat fingered it, someone's typed it in wrong. So we go git status, so we can see what files have changed. You can do git diff as well, and it'll show you what's what's different. So I can get rid of something in there. Git restore host vars uh, PE. Yeah, we don't want that change that I did add. So I've just removed a change that I did. So git add host files, git add pb.common, git commit minus m, uh, introduce error. So I'm doing some syntax checking here locally as well on my commit now. So I'm pushing that check down to the user and we do it also within the CICD pipeline. Now we git push that, so we're pushing it up to GitLab. If we're quick enough, we'll see a pipeline has triggered. And it'll say this pipeline's running. Now this pipeline has a verify branch, assemble the configuration, uh, do a pretest. So is the environment working? It will push the code and then test it afterwards. So let's see. Now I'm not doing anything complex with different branches, etc. here that, that would take forever. But um, sorry, I'm running over a bit. Hopefully no one minds five, five minutes. So we can see here it's running in Docker. It's running a custom image that I created that already has everything installed or Ansible installed, uh, everything to communicate to devices all installed. So it's going to generate the configuration and it will give the user the configuration back. Uh, so you'll see here a little download. So it says download here job artifacts. Uh, so it's run Ansible. Run Ansible, done all the checks, generated the config of those templates we've just seen. And you can see it's give us the backups of what it was and it's give us the new configs of what it's going to be. Now it's going to do a check. So I'll refresh the page. Test, so it's testing it. So it says the default route is present. I'm just, uh, this change is going to revoke the default route from being um, in the routing table. So I'm using Ansible here to do a show IP route on the devices and then assert that the default route is in that routing table and the checks say default route is present. We're just deploying that to the devices. So it's changed them. So we can see here in the output of Ansible down the bottom, it says, um, OK, OK, changed. Nothing failed, which is good. If Ansible fails, it will cause the job to fail. Um, so. And our post test has failed, so we can see that this change to the network has broken. Um, it has broken um, the network, so the default route's not present now. So we're doing validation that our change actually failed. Now this validation could be PyTest, it could be going to um, IP Fabric to do some uh, to trigger a a snapshot and do some revalidation. Um, it could be doing any different. It could be talking to Batfish, etc. Multiple different platforms. Now we can see there's an issue. It failed. So. In a normal scenario, we'll be doing a, a branch, etc., and a merge request. But we can go in um, if we put this back to accept. Um, I didn't actually test this earlier, so git add host files, git commit, um, fix issue. It'll test that my variables are right. 
So it's tested that this is valid YAML. It's because I've got a check YAML test case in there. Um, I could do uh, git push. It looks like I'm typing fast, but I'm just doing reverse searches of what I've already committed. Another pipeline will trigger. And it'll do the process again. This pretest will fail and I've put a check in there. So let's have a look at that. So how you define an Ansible uh, uh, GitLab CICD pipeline is you have a file called GitLab dot GitLab. This is a hidden file, a dot GitLab CICD dot YAML file. And this says the image to run uh, for all these uh, these CICD pipeline. And I've got something called Ansible prep that does a few changes, some file permissions and puts our vault password in there. The stages, so I've got verify, assemble. You can see those on the screen, verify, assemble, pre-test, deploy, post-test. Those are the stages. And then we have the, the different um, jobs. So this is lint branch. So lint branch is assigned to the stage of verify. So we can see here that lint branch is assigned to verify. And we just say install pre-commit, which is what I used to do my syntax checking, and then run it against all files. So that will check Ansible, check YAML, check for white space, etc. I can also check, which I redid for a customer, check if the credentials have been vaulted correctly, which is um, good. So you can say, make sure this is, you know, make sure it's vaulted. Um, we then do some other ones. So we run this playbook and we make sure the files are pushed into, as I saw, as you saw earlier, it allowed me to download them. We can do test, which runs a different playbook to test, but this could be anything, anything you want, doesn't have to be Ansible. Deploy, we then deploy it and then we do a post test. So let's see how that's going. Uh, I didn't actually test this. Okay, so we can see that lint branch passed, checks passed. Now what you would expect normally is this to fail, which it did. Uh, it says default roots not present and it's not present on both of these devices because I'm doing OSPF between the edge router and the um, um, like a, a distribution. It's not present on both. So OSPF is not redistributing it to root two and it's not present because of BGP in, in root one. Um, and then but in my Git, GitLab CI/CD, if you see the pretest, where's the pretest? Here you go, pretest. I say allow failure, allow it to fail, because we expect if it's broken to fail. Um, so we say allow failure. Normally, if it fails, it would cancel everything. Then we can see we've made the change, made the change, and our post test is now succeeding. And if we this is the this is the network. It's just some PCs going through route one to route two to the PE. If we log into this device, we do ping one dot one dot one dot one. Yep, and that's because uh, Axions. It's a bit laggy. Axions, Axions, one two three. So show root. So all that test is doing is showing root and making sure this this in is in here. You could do multiple things. Like if you've got um, load balancing that you can see it's it's being um, advertised by two different um, your two different peers. If you're doing load balancing, etc. There's a lot there, but hopefully I've covered a lot. And now you know how to tame tame the uh, dinosaurs and you, you keep them at bay. I mean all the automation tools, but um, it's a lot to demonstrate in in an hour and a half and talk about all the different things to to allow you to kind of understand what I'm talking about. I, I am talking fast um, because of the time. But um, if you would like to read up on anything, um, I will publish this code. I will also put the 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 one that I've completed with the CICD is also um, uh, up there and available for people to use. So if you do want to do a, uh, you know, a merge request to it, you, you can, um, and I'll keep it up for a while. The Ansible documentation, the GitLab doc, 
documentation, some basics on um, some Git and uh, Docker. Um, I am using Docker to to run the CI/CD pipelines. Now, if you want to get in touch, uh, you can go to Axions Developer Axions.co.uk or get in touch with uh, Jordan, and I think she'll get in contact with you guys anyway to see how it was. If you would like to talk some more, etc., um, have a meeting, etc. We'll be happy to do so. And um, any questions? Sorry for being nine minutes over. A lot to talk about. Thanks, Alex. No problem. There's no questions in the chat box. I don't know if anyone else has any questions at all. No. Thanks, Alex. No problem. Oh, someone's typing. One moment. No. Oh. <laughs> Just a thank you. <laughs> no problem, you Darren. Fabulous. So this will get sent to everyone via email as well as a questionnaire just to get your feedback on um, Alex's presentation today. So thank you so much for attending and we'll send you the email soon. Thanks, everyone. Speak to you soon. Thanks. All. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Cheers.